Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the live stream Sunday worship of Celebration Church in Hoover, Alabama. I'm Pastor David Bradford. Uh, we're live stream on Facebook also, but we're also doing drive-in church this morning uh, at Celebration Church. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, we're glad that you're with us, uh, at least by live stream. I want, you to ask, I want to ask you to gather your family, friends, um, grab your Bible, your cup of coffee, and settle down to um, a time of short Bible study with us this morning. We're continuing in our study of the book of Philippians. So turn to Philippians, if you would, in your Bibles. Uh, this series is entitled, Joy is Contagious. Joy is contagious. I think that title is very fitting in, in um, lieu of what we're going through in our, our nation, country, and our world. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow with me. Father, this morning we love you. We thank you for all that you are in our lives. We praise your holy name. And Father, we pray that your will would we be done in everything that concerns us. Uh, bless us, Father, and give us all that we are to have from your hand. Give us all that we need, Father, and all that you know that we need. We ask that you would forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings and uh, just not putting our hearts and our minds on you like we should, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would guide those that are in authority, the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, those that work at the hospitals, everyone that is involved with the um, care of those that are sick and we are thankful for them and thankful that they are on the front lines of uh, that ministry and care and father we pray that you would bless us this morning as we study your word uh, things have been a little different for us in the last five or six weeks and we we pray your continued hand of of healing on our nation our state city and the world father uh, this uh, virus reminds us lord that we have control of hardly anything that lord you are sovereign and you are in control of everything and you have brought us to our knees and helped us to realize that father we love you go with us now in our time of study and we pray this in jesus name amen so a little quick background on philippians as i said on previous sundays joy is the theme of philippians uh, paul established the church in philippi in 52 AD on his second missionary journey uh, which led him into what we now know as Europe. Before that uh, the churches had only been in Asia Minor which is modern-day Turkey but now the church is moving into Europe into Greece and it will go to Italy and eventually it will go to Britannia and Spain and we are here today because the gospel has spread because of um, the missionary journeys of all of God's men and women. So Philippians, the, the letter of Philippians, was actually written 10 years later by Paul from his Roman house arrest in around A.D. 61. He was under house arrest. It was not the dungeon prison that many times we think of as, as prisons and so forth, but he was under house arrest, uh, able to move around a bit in his own rented house but he was chained to a Roman guard 24 7 so just as a parent lovingly watches uh, his or her child grow to, um, from childhood to uh, adulthood and to become a loving a giving serving adult Paul watched with joy as the Philippian church progressed in their love of Jesus Christ Paul had nothing but joy when he thought of the Philippian church not so with some of the other churches and he really had issue with even the church at Corinth but this church at Philippi was something special as I mentioned last week uh, it was Lydia who Paul met down by the river there was not even a synagogue in Philippi when Paul went there in 52 AD and so uh, normally his routine was to go to a synagogue and to begin to preach Jesus Christ but there's no synagogue in Philippi in A.D. 51 and 52. So he does the second best thing, which the Jewish people would have done, which was to gather down by the river where there was much water, where there was much uh, water to, to, to do ceremonial cleansing in the mikvah and so forth, as the Jewish people would do. 
And uh, when Paul got there, down by the river, he met a wealthy merchant woman named Lydia, who was very instrumental in helping the church get started in Philippi. Uh, many people believe that the church in Philippi actually began in Lydia's house, which would have been a big enough house because she was wealthy, and uh, that the church began in her house. So Paul had nothing but joy when he thought about uh, the Philippian church. Turn with me then to Philippians chapter 1. As we looked at last week and the week before, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and this is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Many people commit this verse to memory. It says, uh, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul was writing that to the Philippian believers. And we can take that to heart also, that whatever God has started in us, once we become believers in Jesus Christ, that God will continue to do that sovereign work in our lives that he started when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Paul knew that God was at work in the lives of the Philippian believers, that God was the author of all that they were to do in the world, and that ultimately the Philippian church was established to bring glory to God. It's all about God, uh, but He, in His mercy and grace, chooses to use us to further His goals. It's all about God. Everything is about God. Rick Warren wrote a book a few years back, and one of the first uh, uh, sentences in the book was, it's not about me. It's not about me. Uh, we're, we're humans. We are flesh. We're jars of clay. We many times will make things about us uh, constantly. That's part of being a human. But as a Christian, we have to deflect uh, any glory away from ourselves and uh, we have to put our heart and mind on Jesus Christ. It's all about God. It's all about God, and it's all about loving other people. That's what uh, this Christian life is about. So Paul wrote in Philippians 1, verse 9. Look down in verse 9 with me. And he says, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. Paul knew that the Philippian believers to be a people of love, and he wanted their love to continue to grow. But here's the thing about love. He tells them that he wants their love to grow in knowledge, and he wants their love to grow in discernment. It's not a, it's not a, a puppy love. It's not an infatuation love. Here's the thing about love. True love possesses knowledge. Otherwise, it's only infatuation. When, when you are in, in grammar school or high school and you saw someone that you really liked and, and it, they, just, they, they were just beautiful in your eyes and your sight and, and all of a sudden you felt yourself maybe just falling for them. You didn't even know them. You might not have ever even talked to them, but you find yourself falling for them. That is an immature infatuation. That is not love. And Paul said, I want you to be a church that has love for each other, but a church that has love for Jesus Christ and for his church. And in order to love him perfectly, you must know his will and his law. Uh, this biblical love that Paul wrote about was not uh, this empty infatuation or some sentiment, but was a love deeply anchored in Jesus and his word. Continuing in verse 9, Paul wanted the Philippians to have every kind of discernment. And we mentioned last week, I mentioned the little poem that I had learned, uh, learn to discern. Discernment happens in the brain. It, when you see something, you make a decision of whether that is good or bad. That is discernment. Uh, the, the discernment is the word used to describe their love. He wanted them to have a discerning love, not a blind love, not an immature love, he wanted the Philippians to, to have a love that could easily spot doctrinal error and heresy. Now, we haven't mentioned that, we haven't mentioned that in, in our teaching yet, but that is when you began a church, when Paul began many of his churches, if you read the epistles of Paul, uh, Galatians, uh, Corinthians, 
you see that once Paul got the church started and Paul left, it wasn't long before uh, maybe the Gnostics came in, those that were not Christians but that had some aberrant view of what it meant to be a, a follower of God, that you had to have some kind of special higher knowledge in order to attain to, uh, to an understanding of, of God. And so the uh, understanding of doctrinal error and heresy and, the, and being able to spot that was very important to Paul, and he commended the Philippian church on being able to do that. So in verse 10 this morning, Paul writes that he wants them to have this knowledgeable and discerning love. Why, why would he want that? So that, in verse 10, you may approve the things that are superior and that you may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. That, that you may uh, approve the things that are superior. Well, that is discernment. You're, you're approving the things that are superior and doing away with the things that are inferior. And what would be the result of that? That you would be pure and blameless. This knowledgeable and wise love would give them the ability to choose the holy and righteous and superior things in the church. And as I said, what would be the result? That they would be pure and blameless on the day of Christ Jesus, the judgment day that we've talked about, that we studied about in the book of Revelation, the last day when Jesus comes back and all people are judged. And Paul is saying that the Philippian church would be found to be pure and righteous in Jesus. So we come to verse 12 this morning in Philippians, and let's read from verse 12 to verse 20. So he continues in his letter, and he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some will preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does this matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or pure, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, so my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul has put it all down where it counts. He is in house arrest. He is chained to a Roman guard 24-7. So here Paul is in prison in Rome. He's writing this letter to the Philippians. Uh, prison is not where anybody would want to be. I, I've allowed my mind to think through of what it would be like to, to be incarcerated, to be in a prison. And it's one of the, the, the hardest things I think that you could ever go through. But Paul is here and Paul finds himself in prison in Rome. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rome was the goal. Rome was where he wanted to be. It was the, the crowning achievement of his missionary journeys. I think he pictured himself in, in going to Rome and going to the street corners and going to uh, uh, the, the highest tops of the mountains and proclaiming Jesus as Savior and Lord. He's made it to Rome, but he's not on the street corner. He's in jail. He's under house arrest. How many of us would, would think to ourselves, you know, I wanted to make it to Rome, and yet here I am, and I am in this house, and I, I cannot speak the gospel freely to the public, and all is for naught. 
It's, it's, it's over. It's ruined. Uh, we're done for. But Paul doesn't say that. He pictured himself preaching on the street corners, and yet Paul has something better that is happening. You would think that Paul being in this house arrest would have hindered the gospel, of the spread of the gospel. Apparently, Satan would have thought so also because I think Satan had a hand in throwing Paul into prison in Rome. Satan probably thought, now we'll shut him up. Uh, the authorities that didn't want him preaching Christ, uh, even the Jewish leaders would have thought, now we'll shut him up. We'll cause him to, he can't say anything now. And God always has a way to spread the gospel. Paul says that what happened to him has actually advanced the spread of the gospel. How in the world would that happen? Paul had joy that the gospel was being spread. Uh, most of us would think that if we're thrown into prison, our lives, our ministry would be over. But Paul is a preacher. He is God's preacher. And preachers have to preach. If you get a number of people together, a preacher is going to start preaching a sermon. If, we are at, if we're together on the 4th of July and you have enough people together, a preacher is going to bring up something about the Bible. It's just the way it is. So what happened to cause Paul to see through the storm and to know that God was orchestrating everything that had happened to Paul? How would Paul find joy in prison? The answer is verse 13. Look in verse 13 in Philippians chapter 1. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Wow, there it is. Paul's going to preach to whoever's around him. And apparently there is a Roman guard chained to him 24-7. He's in his own rented house. He has paid for this house. The Philippian church has taken up an offering to bring it to Paul so that he can continue to pay for this house. Again, this is not the dungeon prison. This is just house arrest. And yet, Paul is here, and he is chained to a Roman guard 24-7. I don't know how long their, their uh, time was each day for their shift. Uh, my uh, son-in-law, Daryl, hi, Daryl, Tessa. Uh, on live stream, Daryl's shift is 12 hours a day uh, as a police officer. Uh, I don't know the, sh if the shift of the Roman uh, guards with Paul. But 24-7, Paul was attached uh, by shackles and a chain. Maybe the chain was 18 inches long. But he was attached to a Roman guard. So who do you think Paul's going to preach to? He's going to preach to the Roman guard. And that guy's going to get the whole dose of it. And so Paul began to preach in his imprisonment to anyone that was nearby. Uh, these Roman guards were uh, what were called praetorian. Uh, the praetorian can be also used for where uh, a, a, the guards were stationed. But it is also a word to denote uh, a guard, the imperial guard, the Roman guards of the house of Caesar. The whole command of the Roman guards, one shift after another shift after another shift, heard about Jesus Christ. I think that they began to talk to Paul, and they began to ask him, I mean, you're, you're shackled with, to somebody for hours and hours and hours a day. So at some point, I think the guards said, you know, we've seen criminals. You don't look like a criminal. You, you don't look like anybody that's really bad at all. Paul, what have you actually done to get in this predicament? And Paul would open up and tell them the, the beautiful story of Jesus Christ and him crucified. The whole guard realized that Paul was no criminal, but that he was in prison because he had preached Jesus as Savior and Lord. And I'm sure that uh, some of the guards were even saved because of Paul's preaching day and night to whoever was with him. There are other parts in the epistles in the book of Acts that says all of Caesar's household began to know who Jesus Christ was. Why? Because the, centuri the, the guards, the, uh, those that were in shackle with Paul, had actually heard of Jesus and had taken this message back to their homes, 
back to Caesar's household, back to Caesar's palace itself. That is how God works. That is how God works. Even when we think that we are done for, that we are down for the count, God takes his message to the far corners of the world. So sometimes when we are going through a hardship, we, we tend to see only what's directly in front of us. We have trouble seeing through the difficulty. It's like we're looking through cloudy water. The trial, the hardship, the tribulation is weighing us down. The clouds have descended on us and we can't see the sunshine. But here's the truth, and pilots know this, that there is sunshine above the clouds all the time. You just have to get above the clouds and you will break out into the sunshine. You have to rise above the clouds to get where it is clear on top. Get up to where you can see clearly. And you can only do that through Jesus and his cross. By our best human efforts, we cannot get ourselves to the point where we are happy or that everything is fine or that, that all things are working out in our lives. But through Jesus and his salvation on the cross, for us, we have eternal life. We have the best life. So Paul said, in effect, that his arrest here had a positive effect. Our hardship right now with this virus, it is debilitating if you get this virus. But God is in the business of turning sin into sanctification, turning trials into triumph, turning hardship into heaven's gain, uh, turning pain into purity, like a, a raw gold or silver. It's, it's melted by the master jeweler and made into a beautiful heirloom piece of jewelry. And that is what God is doing in our lives, even in the midst of a virus and a pandemic. God is with us in every storm and turning life storms around for our good and his glory. That is his specialty. That's what he does the best. Verse 12 says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. What has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. Let's turn that to our situation this, this morning. What if God is glorifying himself through the COVID-19 virus in some way? What if God is drawing to himself people who are frightened of death and wondering where they would go if they died? And it has opened up more conversations about Jesus and that if you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, he is faithful to forgive you of your sins and take you to heaven with him. What if God is orchestrating a cure for cancer through the testing of the COVID-19 vaccines? That gives me chills just to think about it. Of what if, that if, if the virus had never happened, greater things would never happen. I heard yesterday the, uh, the president of West Virginia University was saying that because of the virus and because they've had to shut down the classes and they've had to take classes online, that it has caused the, uh, the leaders in higher education to advance 10 years into the future of what they would have been had we not had to shut down the colleges and the universities. That we are doing things now that we would have only done 10 years in the future. We're doing it now. Uh, even our uh, uh, Facebook live stream, it, it, we had not been live streaming before we uh, got into the, the issue with the virus. And now we've done five or six live streams and we're getting 100 views at least for our church uh, a Sunday just from the live stream. God is a merciful God who gives us chance after chance after chance to come to him. Sometimes he will put us in a vice, seeking to drive us to himself. He will tighten the vice down. And the truth be told, we are in a bit of a vice with this virus. If you have not already come to the end of yourself in this pandemic, you need to. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Beg him to save you from your sins. He is merciful. 
He will love you and he will save you. Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning we are thankful for who you are, that um, you've given us this letter uh, of Paul to the Philippians, that uh, the greatest things, the hardest things that, the, that Satan could pour out on Paul, that Jesus turned it around for his good, and no matter what, the gospel still infiltrated to every cra uh, uh, crack and cranny of the Roman Empire and the world. Father, we pray that those that are around us this next week, that if they do not know Christ, that we would be able to have conversations, open conversations about who Jesus is, that it is imperative that they give their hearts and lives to the Lord while it is still time and while it is still daylight. For the night comes when no one can come to Christ. We pray, Father, that you would bless this church, you would bless your church in the world, you would bless all of the churches that are trying to work through the virus and the quarantine and the stay at home. And we pray, Father, for the pastors that are wondering what they're going to do with their churches and how they're going to get people back. We pray, Father, for your guidance and your leadership. And most of all, Father, we pray for your love, your love in Jesus Christ that, Father, you, you saw who we were going to be. You saw us as sinners, and yet, Jesus, you died for us on the cross to save us from our sins. We love you so much. We thank you for who you are. Come into our lives, Lord, now. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So live stream, audience, we're thankful that you have been with us this morning. We love you. We pray that you'll come back next Sunday. You can find, again, this live stream on my Facebook page, David Bradford, uh, all through the week. Uh, we hope you have a good week. See you later. All right. Thank